Great. So let's get started with this um, this talk called Data and Visualizations that Communicate with Impact. My name is Jen Meehan. I am part of HIP. I am the Associate Director of Digital Strategy and Partnerships. I will be talking about a little bit about storytelling. And I will also present an example of this map we have been created. So Patricia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Nancy Patricia Salguero. I'm a legal representative from the Colombo Venezuelan organization Nueva Ilusión. We are in this is in the border with Venezuela. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Well, my name is Sebastian Netter. I am part of the Wingu team. This is an organization that supports this event. And in this panel, we will be talking about, as Jen said, data, visualization, storytelling, and narratives. So I will also show you some tools and examples to talk about this and understand it better. Okay, so Sebastian, we will now start with you. And I will share the first link. You can see my screen, correct? Yes, we can. Okay, so in terms of the conversation here, have you ever done any kind of data visualization? Please go to this poll and it would be great if we could see what you guys, where you guys are in terms of data viz. Okay, everybody says yes, so we do not have a very depending. Oh, okay, 50-50 now. This is one of the first things that we will be talking about today. We will talk about why is it important to visualize and we will be talking about what kind of conversations we can start with this type of data viz, as Jen was saying. Okay, we have a considerable majority here of those who have participated in data viz solicitation efforts. I don't know if you have created them or maybe you have participated in some of them but if if you agree after this poll let's start discussing some definitions and answering some questions about where is the data when we talk about visualizations we need to understand that of course data is driving the visualizations but where is this data the first concept that we want to talk about is this concept of bi business intelligence. We will find a lot of definitions on the internet about what business intelligence is. Of course, you will find this one, but you could probably find other definitions. Basically, what this means is that with the data that we can collect from different sources or that we actually generate from our own processes or possibly our own organizations, from that data, we can extract ideas in order to make corresponding decisions and to create strategies. So we have two approaches, data that we generate, data that we collect, and then we have some examples of what visualizations are. But when we talk about generating data, the most important examples there would be polls, or any other participation tools for the community that we can start from any space we inhabit. And when we talk about collecting data, it means getting access to the data that other institutions, organizations hold. 
there are, of course, other open data sources that can be um, fed by anyone and can be downloaded by anyone as well. And that is also useful for the organization that is interested in collecting this type of data. Some examples of this open source, so of this data open sources are dataset, CSV, XLS, JSON, and GeoJSON. I don't want to get too technical, but these are the most common formats that you can find this data in open sources. But what they have in common is that these are, these are groups of data that are organized and they are made specific or they are categorized in tabs. So on the right side of the screen, you can see these repositories. You can also share on the chat other sources that allow us to download information and then process it. And why not normalize this information or standardize it with our own data? And from there, we can start taking some decisions. In general, governments from several countries publish or make this data available to the public. These are some of the tools that we can use. For example, Google Sheets. This is a web service from the Google Suite. We do not need to download anything or you do not need any kind of specific browser. It's very comfortable to use. You can start making graphs from those data quite quickly. If we move forward in terms of complexity, this is another alternative, it's called Flourish. This is another free visualization application. And what we do here is import our data source or whatever file we are using to gather data. And in this way, by means of a very uh, user-friendly interface, we can create graphs with a little bit of more complexity or make the data more visual. And two tools that are competing currently for the market of data visualizations and are more geared towards intelligence. That is to say, we can use calculations, computations and formula, and we can add many different data sources. We can link several databases. We can basically concentrate all of these sources in these tools and then visualize them. The purpose of all of these tools is that in, in, in their core, it's to create visualizations, which is, um, these are the four tools that I would like to, to talk about. We have Power BI and Tableau. The first two that I mentioned, Google Sheets and Flourish are free. And the others have this format that they are freemium in a way. So you can start using them for free. And if you want to incorporate other features, you can start paying for other services. The main services for all of these tools are free and the download is also free. So my invitation to you all here is to, to try them out because they are built for any person with a specific knowledge and this only maybe learning from some videos, they can start dragging and getting some information from data sources and start creating data visualizations. I don't know if Patricia, Jen, are we good with this so far? Perfect, thank you very much. As Jennifer was saying on the chat, please add to the chat any question you might have. Okay, so I wanted to share this, this case with you. This is a project with data. This is from 2020. This was the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is something that we do, we did in Wingu. Just to provide some context, Wingu is a company that pushes digital transformation in se for several organizations in Latin America by the implementation of digital tools that are innovative. And this is one of the projects that we worked last year in order to promote this digital impact. The context in which this project happened 
was, as I mentioned before, was the pandemic. This is the first, I would, I would like to just say, the only year of the pandemic. But we'll see what happens. But this is from the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, several areas that had a great vulnerability, the people getting infected, uh, the number of people infected grew in a very accelerated way. So in this context of contagion and pandemic, um, the community care networks in the different territories, what they did, they created several initiatives in order to communicate information around prevention and care. And these are basically community and citizens participation driven tools in order to feed this type of tool. So for example, we could see information about where could people get some sanitary care or emergency care, where could they have basic uh, resources to cover their needs and this specific needs in order to tackle the pandemic in those neighborhoods that were not being actually reached by the government. So what we did in this project, as you can see, for example, here in this image, is to carry out these steps. We obtained the data through a mapping. We started creating territory partnerships. We articulated this type of collaboration with community, or community uh, organizations in order to map where these places were located. And then we started to partner in order to change reality. How? Well, we started communicating this information through the tool. And thank you, Jen, for sharing this link on the chat. So the last step here was to encourage people to start building this, this tool without coding. And this is how we started using these tools in order to really with minimum resources, with the partnership that I mentioned before, with the mapping and with the data of where this, these different cases were located in those vulnerable neighborhoods in Buenos Aires, the idea was to launch a proof of concept that could actually respond to this need. And this is how the application was born. This application that I showed in the first slide, this is how we decided to go from that specific data that we were gathering from the different neighborhoods in order to try to find ways to visualize it and especially tell stories around it. So here we have some examples of several visualizations that were actually achieved with any of the tools here. I will tell you exactly which ones we used for this project, but all of the tools that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk can be used here. The idea here was to be able to show different trends and the reality of what was happening. And we would not only stop there with the visualization, but actually tell a story about it. So with those data, we achieved a visualization so that people that found that information could understand it easily. And then we would tell the story with words so that that could serve as an explanation of what the visualization meant. This allowed us to, to launch certain protocols, to partner with other organizations, in vulnerable areas in Buenos Aires. And the situation little by little started to improve, especially in those neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. So, so far, this is the project that I wanted to share with you all. I do not want to go beyond my time here, but um, any question you have, I am open to answering any of your questions. Now I will pass the floor back to Jen. Maybe if you want to continue elaborating on this story around data and in the many different ways that we can actually tackle the, the data and tell it as a story. Yes, thank you very much, Sebastian. So now let's move on to talk about the storytelling with data. 
and how we can create a narrative based on data visualization. So now that we have talked about definitions and some examples from Sebastian, we would like to hear from you. We would like to know what words define storytelling to you. I will be sharing this link on the chat, similar to the previous one. Let me just share it again so that you can click on it. So please click on that link and type some words that in your mind define what storytelling means. I'll give you 30 seconds to think about that. Yes, it could be any word. The first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the storytelling concept. For example, I would say that for storytelling, there could be characters involved, right? But the words that we are reading now on the on screen are really good. We have emotion, humanize, sensi sensitivity, narrative. I also mentioned that in storytelling, in some sort of narrative, there are characters, there is some sort of plot. Um, I don't know, Sebastian, if you if we could just leave the link there so that people can continue just sharing their, their words and we can continue with the next slide. Besides, we, we're reading really good words on, on, on the screen. Okay, thank you very much for sharing those ideas and those words. Now the question is, why use data storytelling? What is the purpose of data storytelling? I Let me just say that I admit there are so many other reasons to, to use data storytelling, but I would like to emphasize these four. The first one is that when we use a graphic representation of data, it allows people to understand the, the situation faster. So quick comprehension is the first point. Number two is that it can connect with the emotional part uh, of the brain, which was actually the first word that people wrote here, which is the emotional side. The third reason that we would like to share why it is important to use data storytelling is to be more convincing and persuasive. And finally, from the examples here, is that it allows us to identify emerging trends. So coming back to the question of what are the words that you could you could share around storytelling, we have, for example, emotion is bigger, right? Because a lot of people have written emotion. So that's a way to visualize it as an example. OK, so as I mentioned, these are the four reasons in order to think about using data storytelling in your projects. And in this slide, we would like to show you how can we combine the different elements or components of data storytelling in order to reach our goals. This is a visual representation of our, our slide, but we also have some formulas here that allow us to understand what type of tools can we use in order to reach the goal that we have set forward. So for example, the first one is that narrative combined with data allows us to explain people what is happening with that data and emphasizing what is more important because you were able to collect the data and then you use that with a narrative to explain a story. When you, combi when you combine visuals with data, you can also uh, highlight. And this is something that you perhaps would like to, to show your audience uh, a point that they wouldn't have understood otherwise. The third point here is the combination between narrative with some visual elements. This is something that might captivate the, the audience or entice the audience in order to understand something. So perhaps we can add images or videos 
And this is a way of captivating the audience and then having a more engaged and more entertained um, audience. And the last one is the combination of all of them. So visuals plus narrative plus data, this equals change. This is when we actually influence people and then um, encourage them to change, okay? People are asking if we can share those slides, of course. Of course, we will be sharing that. And we have also the links to the projects that Sebastian shared. And also I have another example I would like to share with you. So now similar to the Wingo project that Sebastian explained, through HIP, we have been able to, to start a project uh, mid 2020 when the pandemic was already on its way, we noticed that there was a very, very serious impact on Latino communities in the United States. So what we decided to do, knowing this data, we decided to create a mapping in order to understand what was the disparity impact of COVID-19 in the United States and Latin America. So let me share my screen here so that you can explore the map. So once again, very similar to what Sebastian mentioned before. Once understanding that we had the data, we used, uh, we, we partnered with an organization called Graffiti. And as Sebastian was saying, we used open source data, we use, a, a combination of data open sources like Wikipedia and the Nuestro Mundo website. So we were fetching data from those open data sources around cases, COVID cases and deaths related to COVID. So once you go into this website, you will be able to navigate Latin America the United States and the states inside each country. When we start with this map, you can see that unfortunately, basically every state with data, except three, the Latin community uh, for related to COVID is worse compared to their American counterparts. And I chose for this example to, to go to the state of Arizona. And here, for example, we can see a breakdown of the data in Arizona. So we see that the population in Arizona for Latinos is 31%. Sorry for the small print, but for every 100,000, we have more than 5,000 cases in the Latino community. While in the non-Latino community, we have a little over 3,000. So there you can see the big, big difference of the data. And if you go, for example, to those purple icons, there you will see actually the stories of the impact that this data actually shows. You will see the under on the ground impact of these communities due to COVID. So in order to just stay here in Arizona, I clicked on those video purple icons. And if you click on that, you can go and see the story of the Unlimited Potential Organization, which is a, an organization that works with Latino communities in Arizona. And we can see that there are other stories that are hip partners also developed in New York and Texas and many other states. And we worked with Racimo, Racismo MX in Mexico, which allowed us to create some videos around how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted migrant communities or the trans community or sex workers. So this is a 
a combination of how we got the data and then you were you are able to actually understand the impact in all of these com communities in the first year of the pandemic hopefully the only one as sebastian said and from there you have the opportunity of understanding the stories understanding a little bit more about the organizations and once you learn about that you can actually take action you can support them and finally, what we did as part of this project, we work with a journalist that allowed us to, to create a journalist, to create a narrative around this data. So using the data that I showed on the map and then also adding the videos and adding the stories that we were able to gather from the organizations, we basically see a big picture. This was a text. Um, text result. Uh, I didn't want to share that on the slides, but you will be able to see or read this on the website. And if you read that, you will go more into depth about the financial and healthcare related impacts in all of these communities, among other issues. So we can combine several elements here, all of that based on data in order to create stories, narratives and actions if we go to the next slide here are some tips that i would like to to share with with you around if what you can do if you are considering starting a data project like this one and before publishing it or hitting the publish button you can consider these tips as useful i do not want to to take time away from patricia so that she can share the work that her foundation has been doing and the stories that they have had so far so thank you very much and patricia the floor is yours patricia you are muted right now We cannot hear you. You're muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear. Well, as my colleagues were saying, I'm in Colombia, in Cúcuta, is a Col Colombian and Venezuelan community. We are working with immigrants uh, from Venezuela, given the terrible situation that we are experiencing in this country. I actually lived in Venezuela for 23 years, and it's very painful for me seeing all the suffering and all the events that are happening every day. And I can witness this every day. Uh, we've been working uh, with this uh, foundation, uh, Nueva Vision, for a few years. Uh, when uh, this foundation started, I I went to my country, Colombia, and I saw several uh, lackings in order to for me to nationalize my my children, my grandchildren, to enroll them into school and to be able to, um, to be more present in this territory, to know more about my country because I left my country when I was three years old. I started uh, meeting new people who had been also moved. We were knocking on different doors and facing xenophobia that where they say that people from Venezuela uh, were used to having everything as a gift, everything for free. We are, we're faced rejections for, from several organizations and sectors in the country. So I started thinking uh, about the situation. I knew that it was going to be hard. I didn't know how much, but in 2014, I started this movement to, to really make our children, our grandchildren, nationals of the country to really inform my decisions and to 
increasingly understanding the situation. In 2015, we started seeing contingencies in Venezuela from uh, Venezuelan Im immigrants. As I told you before, there are several stages uh, of this migration movement that started uh, becoming stronger in 2018. In 2018, we had, we had the highest migration. And I started to look for information in Colombia uh, to see what would Colombians do, those who come to Venezuela, to be able to rebuild our life, because many of us lost everything in Venezuela. So in 2014, we couldn't really purchase anything in the market. Or, uh, there were a lot of uh, of actions that were limited because of the process of the government. So I started to investigate and to create different situations in order for us to be linked with our country, from everybody who was coming to Venezuela. Uh, also with our connationals, with our Venezuelan brothers and sisters that were coming back then in that stage without any guidance, without knowing where to go to. I mean, from the beginning, immigration started because of lack of food and safety and security. Now it's even harder because there's no water, there's no power, there are no means of living in order to be able to go out from this situation. So in our foundations, uh, since two years ago, uh, because of course, as our teacher that uh, we met in an online concert that happened to pass humanitarian aids, we started helping all of the people who stayed in this side because the president of Venezuela had closed all the roads and there were a lot of people who had to stay here. So we had three shelters where 2,700 people slept uh, from this part of Colombia in those shelters. Then we had Urla Central Kitchen who started helping us with foods for these families, for, with snacks and food. And since February, 2019, they have been working with us we are located in the patios in Cúcuta. And that road that goes from Cúcuta to Pamplona, Bogotá, Cucaramanga, and other cities, those are the roads that uh, the immigrants have to walk since 2015 because they just walk out. In the first stage, we only had males looking for new fam new ways of life for their families. These men never came back to look for their families. Sometimes they uh, were find other, other partners, etc. And then we had women and children walking away because, uh, let me tell you, colleagues, these are long roads. These are cities uh, and months that have to be walked. So we have known about people that when they get to the Berlin uh, Paramo, which is an area where we have uh, below temp zero temperatures, people had died trying to cross that area. So this is a dire situation uh, nowadays in terms of immigration, because every day, we see more Venezuelans coming out or leaving the country. So from 200 to 300, 380 people that leave Venezuela every day, that just walk out and are looking for a different life, looking for their families. They're thinking that they are going to get to Bogota, Cali, or Peru, uh, or another country, and they'll find the, their families that had left before. 
uh, some others are looking for a new way of life. So we treat uh, this population, we help them, people also who, who came and stayed in Kukuma and the means of life is no secret that many countries, uh, I mean, it's difficult to find finding jobs or work and they find them this type of works. In this stage of immigration, we see women that are alone, that are the head of the family. Sometimes they have four, five, eight children, each one of them. And that's very concerning for all in this new, new Nueva Ilusión work team, because we see in the streets, mothers with six, seven children, and the whole population uh, in uh, immigration are now children. And that's very concerning for us because many of them are dehydrated uh, or malnourished. And that fills us with, uh, with sadness. So we try through the two organizations that have been helping us for two years, it was at the kitchen and I said, so they are the ones who provide uh, the vegetables or the, the food. And we have legal department, we have two attorneys and Many of these populations will have to figure out certain problems with their documentation. So they go through several difficulties in their journey, uh, trying to look for a new life or children who want to, to study. So the different stages that they have to go through. So we are present here every day, helping them. But we don't have any help from the government or the international communities. We only have uh, access to uh, World Central Kitchen's aid. As I told you before, sometimes we have to uh, pay the tax by sweeping or cleaning. So it's very difficult to work with this, uh, but we remain in our efforts trying to help these communities, which are a lot. All com Colombians who return to Venezuela, the, immig the immigrants, the Venezuelans that have increasing needs and the permanent population that is settled in this city, as well as the adopted population, which we've seen a lot. A lot of historical poor people in the territory help these Venezuelans, uh, even if they also need food or if they don't have anywhere where to cook. Uh, sometimes we can provide them with the foods, but they cannot cook them because they don't have a kitchen or or a foreigner, so the, the difficulties are increasing every day. Patricia, actually, one of the questions about this. Uh, you've told us about the families, and Stan was sharing some pictures uh, in terms of the Venezuelans that help you. You see the same people every day, or is that part of the process that they have to walk through, as you mentioned, in terms of accessing different Colombian cities? Uh, what, what are you seeing in that sense? I, do, do you have people coming back or they go through different stages? Well, we have our main headquarters in the patios that also attend the pendulum and adopted communities we are close to the border. So we see Oreña, San Antonio and San Cristobal states. These pendular people try to work during the day. They arrive as early as they can. We help them with uh, breakfast and they work all day long. And at night they go back to their families and provide them food. So we see five populations that we 
uh, turn to. And in the patio headquarters, we see pendular and permanent uh, people. And in the Varos uh, headquarters, that in order to leave to other states or countries, that's when we see the walkers that are the other two pictures that Sebastian has. That we they where there are uh, children in the floor and we give them food. Those are the walkers. So uh, the population that is permanent uh, is have these uh, topperwares, but the the walkers only have uh, disposable um, containers. And a couple of months ago, we implemented having uh, disinfecting the toppers uh, because of the COVID concern, and we disinfect everything. So in the foundation, we have 25 volunteers, which are Venezuelan immigrants, and uh, starting at 4 a.m., they start working, they start cooking uh, in order for the population to have breakfast and lunch ready because the, the need is high, the vulnerability is huge. And I do believe, and uh, I'm certain about this, out of these six years that I've been working with immigrants, and uh, with that population, which is the most uh, vulnerable that is leaving Venezuela. That's the, the population that is in need. There are mothers, heads of families. You can see in the pictures, they have five, six children, each mother. And it's very concerning for us because those, those stretches of roads are very dangerous for children to be exposed to highways, to roads, to, to the cold, to the different weathers that they have to face. And also rejection, rejection, xenophobia, we see it present everywhere. Patricia, uh, we were talking with Jen that you choose to show, and it's, it's beautiful, uh, images that reflect a little bit about the appreciation from children that are happy, that are receiving the help and support. So how do you decide to, to communicate it that way? And how do you get to those pictures? Um, if you think that by sharing this type of, of pictures, you have a greater impact. What's your experience on that? My experience is that I'm very concerned. I mean, we have uh, uh, the parents signing an authorization so we can use the pictures. Uh, we have them in writing so we can avoid any problems further on the way. That was a recommendation by different organizations that we work with. But we like to see the impact that is generated when a children, when a child gets its food, because there are children that come from uh, cities that are very far away, and they've been working, walking for 18, 20 days. in order to receive something because they say that a lot of the walks that they have uh, to do uh, they sometimes receive bread or cookies or something but they don't provide a plate a, a plate of soup water cold juice or a formal meal so when they receive this they are very happy and we are very proud of having this impact. And to be really humble in showing or sharing the work that we do and create awareness. Because if you see them in the roads, you can help them. If you see the children that are asking for a glass of water, it's because they're thirsty and they need it. Because 
there's a, there has been an impact with a lot of people that don't have houses and they try to tell them that to avoid these risks. Uh, this happened with a person who asked that to a walker and the, the person answered, we cannot eat our walls. I may have a, a home, but I cannot eat in Venezuela. We don't have bread. We don't have food. And people selling the food are selling very, very expensive food. And we cannot let our children die of hunger. So there have been questions that uh, I'm asked by xenophobics uh, in terms of why I'm giving food to people because they're against it. So if they see the need that there is and the happy faces in the children when they receive a plate of soup or a, a piece of fruit, I mean, children are turning eight or nine years old and they've never had a pear or an apple. They call it the red mango because they didn't know what an apple was. So in Venezuela, many of these children couldn't really access uh, fruits or this type of food. So sometimes when we see uh, how happy they are when we give them fruit, that's priceless. And to see we happiness that they are eating their lunch or their food when they get to Cucuta, and also the population that we help every day because it's not we're not trying to damage anybody. People who are permanent residents, we tell them that they'll receive benefits for three months while the father or the mother uh, have uh, find a job and can really figure things out. But when we see a single mom, uh, sometimes that they, they, they have a room that they have to pay every day. And if the mother sells candy during the day, that only gets her to pay where to sleep, but not where to eat. So... Those are many things that most of the people cannot see, most of the people criticizing the movement. So for us, it's very satisfying to be able to collaborate with all this population that need it. It's, it's amazing the story that you tell us. We don't need more data. I mean, we can listen to Patricia, and, and, and it's enough uh, just by listening to what she says. So I think I would like to ask you, what possible partnerships can you foresee or possible answers are offered generally from governments or states, not necessarily national governments, if they have contact contacted you, what's their relationship there? And another question regarding the organizations that you work with, with the partnerships that you have, I guess that the answer to the first question is negative. So that would reinforce the idea of generating new partnerships and alliances. So to wrap up my second question is, what can we tell people who are listening or watching us, what to do, how to contact you, how can you can they help you or be aware of what you're doing in your foundation? Sure. Well, uh, since six years ago, what motivates us is to provide certain information from all of this population that gets here without any information. And I'm telling you this because this actually happened to me because when we decided uh, to organize a group of friends, everybody coming from Venezuela and creating this foundation, it was a mixed 
uh, foundation that provide dignified treatment because we have gone through different pro problems. And those of us working here, the voluntaries who have families who are who have needs, who don't have any means of sending something to their families or any wages, voluntary members, sometimes they don't even have soap or shampoo because we don't receive a wage or a payment for anything, but our heart is open to continue to help. Thank you, Patricia. Sebastian, I, I saw that you answered the question uh, via the chat, but also as Sebastian mentioned, uh, we have Google Sheet, which is a basic tool to start building visual uh, graphics. Um, being Google, you have uh, you access to thousands of trainings or help that you could look for to, so, so they can help you to create certain graphics or tables. Also from HIP to share our mapping with what, which was our project. We use a company called Graffiti that is based on the US, but it is pretty good. And the other one that Sebastian mentioned is Search, that I think they also have a free platform, correct? Yes. Yes, that's the other one. That I think that one is great and it's easy to use. So those are good places to start. Yes, of course. Yes. What we need to, we want to do is to provide dignifying treatment to our population to help them because we know that it's not easy. And every day, I mean, we barely see tears because every day we talk with them, we motivate them. We talk with uh, professionals, with families from Venezuela. We've seen soccer players. We've seen pretty good people helping because Venezuela has a great uh, big population. I live there and it's painful for me I, because I have my Venezuelan grandchildren and we are in, very impacted by the immigration that we see every day, the families that leave the country every day with their children, looking for a future, looking for an education, looking for a way out. And Nueva Ilusión identifies with all of these families, with all these people that every day are praying for, for being someone. So with our work, I think we can also have legal and psychological counseling and for us, it's very important for us and for the children. Children are, are really need psychological attention and care with families that have been destroyed, uh, parents divided, children alone. Uh, that's everything that we live throughout these two years. Children that are 12, 13, 10 years old that are looking for their parents by themselves. If we cannot do anything for them, that's very painful. So we'll continue working with our team. Uh, we also have professional workers that really devote themselves to this work, both from Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, we are trying to make this easier for them. Thank you very much, Patricia, for opening up with us and sharing this impressive work, uh, that what you do and how the, the foundation works. I... I just put this slide so people have a way to contact you. And it will be very valuable for anybody who is watching uh, to be able to communicate with you. 
Yes, yes, of course. We I really love these uh, spaces uh, to create awareness, to know, and it, to see if we can collaborate even with a small grain of salt that's very well received by these people and also to provide uh, a humble and good mm -hmm. care for them to feel good because many people have really uh, thanked us and that's just a piece of home that of Venezuela that they love and miss and well we continue working here uh, thank you for giving us this wonderful state of space Thank you, both of you. Uh, Sebastian uh, is leaving the information from pa Patricia, myself, and Sebastian's information. So if you have any other questions, we are here to help. I believe, Sebastian, Patricia, unless you have any other questions, we can close this session out. Uh, we're on time. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian and Jen. And we're at your disposal for anything that you'd like to talk out with us. Thank you.